This is the first video in the Further Mechanics series intended for Year 13. So what we'll be covering in this video is specification points 97 and 99, which are understanding how to use the equation for impulse. So impulse is a new concept in Year 13, which connects back to momentum in Year 12, and we're going to be connecting impulse to Newton's second law of motion. And then secondly, we're going to understand how to apply conservation of linear momentum. We've done this before, but we've done it in Year 12 along the line and at GCSE. This time, we need to be able to do it in two dimensions using our horizontal and vertical components of momentum because it is a vector. But just very quickly, let's do some prior knowledge from GCSE and Year 12 mechanics. What is momentum? If you look up the definition of momentum, you will be told that momentum is the product of an object's mass and its velocity. This is absolutely true. However, it's not terribly helpful for us to picture what is going on here. So you can think of momentum as being how difficult it is to stop an object once it starts moving. And yes, of course, if it's a bigger object, if it has greater mass, then it's going to be more difficult to stop. And if it has a higher velocity, it's going faster, it's going to be more difficult to stop. What about changes in momentum? So if our equation is P is equal to mv, we could divide this up into, if the momentum changes, for example, because the velocity changes, then we would have to divide this up into Pi, which was our initial momentum, which would be mu, and Pf, the final momentum, which is mv. And of course, a change in momentum then would be delta P, and it would be mv minus mu. So if you want to find how much your momentum changes, you simply find what the momentum is before something happens and figure out what the momentum is after. So that's our first sort of equation that we're going to keep an eye on. You could rewrite this as delta P is equal to m on v minus u. And if, just because we can, we divided that by t, you'd end up with delta P over t is equal to m on v minus u over t. A little bit of rearranging, delta P over t is equal to m on v minus u over t, which of course that we should know is acceleration. So delta P over t then ends up being an A, which of course should be very familiar to us from our mechanics studies in year 12. And I'm going to move over here. That means that delta P over t is equal to force because f is equal to ma. So this is how the change in momentum connects in with Newton's second law. And if we cross multiply this, we're going to get ft is equal to delta P. This is the impulse equation that is referred to in our specification. This here is impulse. It is out of the unit Newton seconds. It's not very helpful, at least I don't think it's very helpful as a concept either. But remember that impulse is equal to change in momentum. So that's what it is. An impulse is a change in momentum. And I find that easier to rationalize. If we want to use the equation for impulse, we might get a graph like this and be asked to say what the impulse is or even what the change in momentum is given force on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And of course, we know that we're looking for a quantity that has the value of newtons on the unit, newton second. So we're going to have to multiply force by time. And from motion graphs and previous graph work, you'll know that you're expanding the area under the graph. So you're basically going half base times height for the first half of this triangle here, and then half base times height for the second, which will give you half 20 times 100 plus again half 20 times 100, which is a value of 2000 newton seconds. Normally, when you're asked for the impulse, you give the unit as newton seconds. But it wouldn't be incorrect to write the unit here as kilograms meters per second, because we know that impulse and change in momentum are the same thing. So if you can't remember newton seconds, you just multiply force times time. So but if you can't, you can just as easily use the, the unit for momentum. Going back to our 
change the momentum version of each and second law, what we have to appreciate is that time is the key factor here. So what we're saying here is that the force that's required to change the momentum of an object, so let's imagine that we're trying to stop something, the force that is required to stop it depends, of course, on how much momentum the object is, has. So its mass times its velocity so bigger and faster is going to be more difficult and therefore require more force. But if you're taking any particular situation you, that you're trying to stop an object in, its mass and its velocity are sort of predetermined before you try and stop them. The key factor becomes the time over which you attempt to stop them. If you can increase this time somehow, then you can see from this equation that the force is going to decrease. And conversely, if you decrease the time, so if you have to do it very suddenly, you're going to require a much bigger force. The idea of impulse and changes in momentum and force is used a lot in ball games. So we can see here an athlete and he's about to catch the ball. If you just stick your arms out and let the ball smash into them, what's going to happen is that you're trying to change the momentum of the ball over a very short period of time. You're going to need a large force and it's going to hurt. And depending on the ball, if it's a cricket ball or a baseball, then it's going to hurt a lot and you risk breaking your fingers. Better is to put your hands up and then pull your arms in towards your body as you catch the ball. You're slowing it down gradually, which means you increase the time in that equation and therefore decrease the force. Footballers use the idea of impulse because the longer their foot remains in contact with the ball, the greater the impulse there will be for a given kicking force. And the greater impulse, remember, means a greater change in momentum. So you're going to end up with the final momentum of the ball being greater if you follow through with your foot. So you keep your foot in contact with the ball so that you are increasing the time over which you are applying your force. Tennis players use this idea of impulse too. The tension in the racket strings for a tennis player is very important. If the strings are loosely strung, the ball, ball stays in contact with the racket for a longer time. And so the impulse that you get, and therefore the speed that the ball travels is greater. There is a downside to this, of course, because as the ball is traveling faster, it is more difficult to control its direction. Tennis players compensate for this, for this by adding spin. But of course, the faster the ball goes, the more you have to spin it. Now, Rafael Nadal, who's shown in the picture, he is an expert at this. He has his racket strung very low tension and has to, and does, as a result, impart huge topspin to keep the ball in the court. Novak Djokovic is on the opposite end of the spectrum. He has his rackets more tightly strung so that he has more control over where the ball goes. The idea of force change in momentum can be applied even to the simplest things. So this is a children's playground and it's covered with this semi-soft material. It's not very thick, but the idea behind this is to increase even slightly the time over which the momentum of the child that might be falling off the swing or just falling over, increase that time slightly so that the force on the child is less. Let's talk about conservation of linear momentum. The principle of conservation of momentum says that in any interaction between bodies, the momentum before is equal to the momentum after. You will see on exams that this always has two marks on it. So this bit, momentum before equals momentum after, that's the only the first mark. If you want the second mark, you have to say provided no external force. So there's always a qualifier on that. And what do we do with linear momentum? I've just shown a very simple example of the sort of thing that you do in year 12 and also at GCSE with this. Collisions in one dimension. So you've got your 2 kilogram mass traveling at 5 meters per second, giving it a momentum of 10 kilograms per meters per second. It collides with the 5 kilogram mass, and we know that the momentum after, when you add up, depending on what happens with the two object, objects, when you add up the momentum after, it should equal 10 kilograms per meters per second. That's how we do the linear momentum. It applies to collisions and explosions. So with explosions, you have zero momentum before. They go off in opposite directions. So one momentum is positive and one momentum is negative, and they add up to zero after. At A level, we consider two-dimensional momentum conservation problems. 
This is best illustrated with an example. So these pictures that you at the top show a non-relativistic alpha particle colliding with a helium nucleus. The yellow lines in the lower photograph are the tracks of the collision in the cloud chain filled with helium gas. So this is the collision that we're concerned with. We're going to turn this slightly on its axis so that the incoming um, alpha particle is traveling along the horizontal. We can do that as long as we adjust the angles accordingly. Both particles have a mass of 6.65 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, because that's the mass of the alpha particle. And we have to show that the initial momentum of the alpha particle is conserved. And this is how I'm going to illustrate how you do collisions in 2D. The first thing we have to do is to appreciate that momentum is a vector. And so we have to figure out what the horizontal and vertical components of any of these momenta are. And this is why we turn to the axis of the incoming so that it doesn't have any vertical and is all horizontal. So in order to do the momentum before this collision, we need to calculate how much the horizontal momentum of the alpha particle as it comes in is. So to do that, I'm going to say horizontal momentum is 6.65 times 10 to the minus 27 multiplied by 1.5 times 10 to the 7, which gives us a momentum of 9.975 times 10 to the minus 20 kilograms meters per second. Our, and we'll put a little i here to show that that's initial, our vertical initial momentum is zero. Okay, so these are going to be two very important numbers for us. But in order for momentum to conserve, be conserved, our final horizontal momentum has to equal that, and our final vertical momentum has to equal zero. Now, what about afterwards? And you can see that I've pre-labeled some of the horizontal and vertical components here. So for the alpha particle as it comes out of the collision, its vertical component is labeled X, and its horizontal component is labeled Y, and A and B for the helium nucleus. Let's start with the alpha particle. We're going to find the vertical component of its velocity first, that is x, and that's going to be 1.23 times 10 to the 7 multiplied by sine 35, which gives us a value of 7.055 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. What about its horizontal component, which we've labeled y? Well, that's 1.23 times 10 to the 7 times cos 35, which gives us a value of 1.0075 times 10 to the 7. Okay, so once we've got those velocities, we can go ahead and we can find the horizontal and vertical components of the momentum of this alpha particle simply by multiplying these values here our horizontal and vertical components by the mass. And I'll, I'll do that, speed up the video, you can pause it, calculate it yourself, and then just check in at the end. Okay, you can see I'm using subscripts here for horizontal, alpha, just so it's clear which one is which. And so we're going to then keep an eye on these numbers here because we're going to need them at the end. Now we do the exact same thing and we do it for the helium nucleus that comes off. So again, I'm going to calculate and speed up the video, but you are calculating the A, which is the vertical component of the velocity of the helium nucleus, multiply that by the mass, and the horizontal component of the velocity of the helium nucleus and multiply that by the mass.
And there we have it. So now, let's just grab our plot for a moment. What we have now are the horizontal and vertical components of the momentum of each one after the collision. So we know that when we add the two horizontal momenta together, we should end up with the same number we got, 9.975 times 10 to the minus 20. When we add up the two vertical components, remembering, of course, that strictly one of them will be a negative, so we should have a negative sign. When we add up the two vertical components, we should end up with zero. Now, of course, during the, over the course of this calculation, there will have been some rounding, so if there are small differences, we're not going to worry too much. So let's have a look and see, do we actually end up where we should? Let's start with the vertical components, because we know those should add up to zero. So, if we look at our momentum, the vertical momentum for the alpha particle, that is 4.69 times 10 to the minus 20, and the vertical momentum for our helium is minus 4.687, sorry, minus 4.685. Those are close enough together to say, yes, the vertical momentum is conserved. What about the horizontal momentum? So with our horizontal momentum, we now have 6.5. 7, 0 times 10 to the minus 20, plus that. Let's add those two together and see what we get. Okay, so our horizontal momentum after the collision is 9.98 times 10 to the minus 20. Let's have a look at that and see if that's the same as our original horizontal momentum. And we scroll up and we see 9.975 times 10 to the minus 20. So, yes, the momentum is conserved. 